This is a production of Cornell University. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lee Constantinou, who is an associate professor of English at the University of Maryland. Um, he is uh, recently the author of uh, the book Cool Characters, which is a study of form, the form and function of irony in uh, the work of a number of uh, 20th and 21st century post-World War II writers, uh, such as Ralph Ellison and uh, William S. Burroughs and Thomas Pynchon, Cornell's own Thomas Pynchon, I might uh, mention, uh, Jennifer Egan, and others. Uh, the book takes its impetus, or at least, oh. <laughs> Software changes are required. I'm not going to try to do that. Uh, uh, the book takes its impetus, or at least responds to uh, David Foster Wallace's well-known ambivalence about the pervasive irony in um, <clears throat> what is often called postmodern literature. Uh, and indeed, David Foster Wallace is the subject of a collection of essays that uh, Constantinou uh, edited in 2012, and that is called The Legacy of David Foster Wallace. And David Foster Wallace, uh, as it happens, was born in Ithaca. The, uh, so Lee has uh, published and has forthcoming a number of articles and book chapters on uh, various issues and figures in post-World War II fiction and culture. Of particular note uh, is uh, a book coming out on Helen DeWitt's novel, The Last Samurai, and an edited collection uh, about Art Spiegelman. <clears throat> Uh, finally, um, I should note that Lee is the author. He knows a lot about irony because he, and from the point of view of novelist, uh, because he is the author of the novel Pop Apocalypse, uh, which is a satire about our possible near future. Uh, he is currently writing a book about the history of comics and graphic novels, uh, which I think we are going to hear a bit of uh, in his talk today. Um, so please join me in welcoming Lee Constantin. Oh, thank you, thank you for that introduction, Kevin, and thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to to speak here in honor of Dan. This is sort of amazing to me to to be back in Ithaca, and uh, I discovered when I sort of stepped out of the Statler Hotel where, where they're keeping us that all my muscle memory from my time at Cornell has just instantly come back to me. I, I sort of navigate the campus totally unconsciously and sort of recede immediately back into my own head, just like I did back when I was an undergraduate here. So thank you, uh, thank you all. And I have a prepared text and there are sort of are times where I'll maybe break from the prepared text and make a few comments uh, and reflect on uh, how uh, what I'm going to read uh, connects back to uh, some of the themes that were uh, sort of uh, persistently uh, brought home in, in Dan's classrooms uh, when, I was, when I was here as a, uh, an undergrad. And so this is sort of, uh, when they asked me to come and talk, I, I kind of thought, well, there's going to be a mixed audience, there are going to be academics, there are going to be students of dance, there are going to be members of the wider community. And so uh, in what follows, I'll try to pitch this at sort of multiple levels at the same time. Um, okay. And let's, oh, okay, this is up. Great. And the title of my talk is uh, Modernist Funnies or uh, Comics in the Age of Mass High Culture. Um, okay. I'm so pleased to be back here at Cornell uh, to celebrate Dan's distinguished career. Uh, I first met Dan in the spring of 1997, uh, more than 20 years ago in my freshman writing seminar. English 270, The Reading of Fiction. Uh, born and raised in Queens, the child of Greek immigrants, uh, a first generation college student, I came to Cornell knowing I loved literature. But at the time, I saw my love of literature as a hobby. I never imagined I might pursue an academic career. At the age of 18, I had more practical uh, dreams and aspirations for my future. What I really wanted to do, the practical uh, vision for my future, uh, was that I wanted to become a cartoonist, a much more practical vocation than the one I ended up pursuing. <laughs> Though, like many 18-year-olds, I had no idea how to go about pursuing such an aspiration. But as a freshman, uh, among other things, I wanted to test my abilities as a reader against the most ambition fiction I could get my hands on. I wanted to learn to improve my writing. 
So I took a freshman writing seminar that promised to challenge me in just this way. And Dan's 270 course delivered exactly what I was hoping for, but also ended up giving me a lot more. Dan was not only a model of intellectual rigor, but he was an extremely open and generous person, as I think like literally the only word that is common across every talk we've heard is open. Uh, and I think that is a kind of a perfect word to encapsulate what uh, defines Dan as a person. I think he saw each and every one of us not as students, or not only as students, or first as students, but first as human beings. And as someone now who has taught a lot, I can assure you that is not an easy thing to do sometimes. You know, lots and lots of students come through your classroom. Dan uh, seems to have a kind of encyclopedic memory for names, faces, years. Uh, he probably remembers uh, that freshman writing seminar in greater detail than, than I do in probably some cases. Uh, and I enjoyed his course so much, I took his class on Ulysses as well as his class on Holocaust literature. And uh, as I pursued literary study here at Cornell, which I think is one of sort of the best places you, you can pursue literary study for all sorts of reasons, I came to recognize the pleasures and possibility of academic inquiry. Though I didn't end up pursuing my interest in cartooning in the way that I thought I would, in my senior year, I decided to write my college scholar honors thesis on Art Spiegelman's graphic memoir, Mouse. And as it turned out, Dan was the ideal mentor to direct that thesis. He was the perfect mentor not only because he had himself written about Mouse in his study, Imagining the Holocaust, but also because his approach to pedagogy and interpretation was so open-minded and generous. After all, as has already been suggested this weekend, Dan is far more than a specialist in modernist literature. He has written elegantly not only about modern fiction and poetry, but also on painting, sculpture, and of course, in one instance, a graphic memoir. He has written cultural studies and media criticism. In the classroom and on the page, he has embodied his creed that works of art are, quote, by humans, about humans, and for humans. And you wouldn't think that would be a controversial credo, but you know, I think in some cases it is. And uh, I think Dan you know, makes a wonderful case for defending that view. Um, I suppose there is a slight irony that in the case of my experience of Dan's mentorship, we spent a great deal of time during my senior year discussing anthropomorphic mice rather, <laughs> rather than humans. <laughs> Uh, in my remarks today, I want to, in a sense, continue the dialogue that began that fresh, in that freshman writing seminar. I offer a selection uh, from a new book project that I'm working on. Kevin mentioned my first book, uh, it's called Cool Characters, is a literary history of irony in the US. It's a very kind of, you know, I wouldn't call it a you know, traditional work, but it's you know, a work that focuses on literary texts. I was fortunate to receive uh, tenure from my uh, university last year, and so now I can kind of pursue the interests of uh, my youth and my, you know, let my id, let my id out now that I have tenure. Uh, I offer a selection uh, from a new book project I'm working on. Uh, the project is tentatively called The Cartoon Art, Comics in the Age of Mass High Culture. The project investigates the remarkable rise of comics since the 1970s. And here, I should also comment that I'm going to try to uh, intersperse uh, sort of elements of this project that I'm working on with comments about teaching. This is a conference about teaching and everything I say I think has like direct implications uh, on how we teach literature in the classroom, how we bring students to uh, various uh, media, various cultural traditions, uh, various genres. And so where appropriate I'll, I'll try to talk a lot about teaching. The project investigates the remarkable rise of comics since the 1970s. How, I ask, have comics moved from the margins of American culture to something like the center? How have we gone from the 1950s, a time when comics were widely regarded as lowbrow low trash, to our present situation, a time when cartoonists are winning MacArthur fellowships and getting uh, recognized as major artists? The goal of my project is not so much to elevate or legitimate comics, that work, I contend, has already been done, and done quite successfully, but rather to ask how comics won the war for its legitimation. Was it a change in the attitudes of our cultural gatekeepers? Uh, did the medium of comics change? And so, uh, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm you know, bringing the set, kind of the priorities that, that Dan talks about with his credo, uh, always the text, always historicized, to this 
kind of research question. You know, is it a question of history? Is it a question of the text? The answer is, of course, it's both at the same time. And one of the things we do as scholars and as teachers is to sort of tell that story, tell that narrative, uh, lay it out for students, lay it out for uh, uh, fellow specialists in our field. Uh, and so I see the kind of relationship between teaching and scholarship as uh, very, very much continuous. The two, the two can't be separated, in my view. So I'll begin uh, in the 50s. Uh, the preface of uh, The Immediate Experience, uh, a book collecting the essays of the film critic Robert Warshaw, offers an excellent starting point for our inquiry into these questions. Warshaw was an important young critic associated with the New York intellectuals. He was in many ways a highbrow, a Mandarin in the making, but he was also sensitive to the possibilities of popular culture in a way many of his contemporaries weren't. His promising career was cut short when he died of a heart attack at the age of 37 in 1955. The preface of this collection reprints a Guggenheim Fellowship application Warshaw originally wrote in 1954. In this application, Warshaw lays out the plan for a book he wants to write about film. Warshaw wants to articulate his own critical philosophy and to distinguish that philosophy from two other competing approaches to the analysis of film. Uh, the approach of what he calls the aesthetic critic and the approach of the sociological critic. What the aesthetic critic seeks in film is, Warshaw writes, almost always something he can recognize as legitimate to the world of art, which is to say analogous to the effects of other art forms on their highest levels. The sociological critic, meanwhile, seeks to discover direct correspondences between the movies and life or they seek the complex and deep interpretations of psychoanalysis, or they seek in film some other reflection of social reality. To the degree that the sociological critic is interested in aesthetic questions, she reduces these questions to forms of mass psychology. As Warshaw puts it in a pithy formula, the sociological critic says, in effect, it is not I who goes to see the movies, it is the audience and my job is to analyze the audience. The aesthetic critic says, it is not to the movies that I go, that I, I go to see, it is art. But for Warshaw, neither approach gives a good account of the experience of seeing a film. On the one hand, Warshaw believes movies deserve serious intellectual attention. On the other, he would not have us pretend films are high art in any conventional sense of the term. Movies are, he argues, still the bastard child of art, and if in the end they must be made legitimate, it will be a changed household of art that receives them. And there's a lot you can unpack, uh, quite a long close reading you could do of that quote. Uh, from our contemporary perspective, Warshaw's proclamations might seem at best dated, at worst pompous. In the first place, Warshaw's declaration ignores half a century of film criticism that came before him. As early as 1911, the Italian film theoretician Ricotto Canuto said film promised to become the sixth art. In 1923, Canuto revised his numbering scheme, calling film instead the seventh art, a term still used today to, de to describe the medium. This new art in the making, though still in Canuto's view, awaiting its genius, nonetheless promised something great to the established system of the arts. Film, and specifically the cinema cinematograph, offered up a, quote, conciliation between science and art, as well as between the rhythms of time and the rhythms of space. The medium of film promised to become nothing less than a plastic art in motion, a dynamic mixture of architecture, music, painting, sculpture, poetry, and dance. So there are significant precursors to the view that film might constitute a new art form that does more than merely replicate existing artistic standards. Our second criticism might take a different approach, questioning Warshaw's assumption that there are valid criteria by which one might distinguish high art and popular culture. After all, the boundary between the high and the low, between art and culture, has been the target of sustained theoretical attack for more than half a century. Indeed, the notion that practitioners of new art forms should care one way or another about the conditions of their legitimation, whether or not they're bastards, as he would put it, today seems in itself, well, illegitimate. After all, in the view of many sociologists of culture, we're not nearly as hung up on accumulating cultural capital as we used to be. 
Once upon a time, elite consumers of art sought to distinguish themselves from everyday consumers of culture, from the market, from commodification, and so on. But today, elite consumers aren't snobs. Instead, we've become, as some sociologists argue, omnivores whose tastes easily leap across cultural registers. Though I often disagree with his specific critical judgments, I don't think we can dismiss Warshaw's argument so easily. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought it up at all. Uh, we need to ask what it means that so many new art forms have been recognized or invented since the 1950s. Indeed, since Canuto dubbed cinema the seventh art, other arts have been numbered according to this scheme. Uh, in 1964, the French film critic Claude Belly dubbed comics the ninth art, and the, ni the name has stuck in France. And uh, the Franco-Belgian comics tradition has its own specific history, which I'm not going to talk about today. But uh, many of the same concerns that I'm talking about replicated themselves in Europe. And uh, starting in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of cross-pollination between the European comic scene and the American comic scene. Uh, and I won't talk about that, but it's quite interesting. So when accounting for our cultural moment, it's not sufficient to say that the distinction between high art and popular culture has been overcome. I want to argue instead that the questions that drove the old mass culture debate, which uh, many, in many ways can seem so old fashioned today, have taken on a new life in these waning days of postmodernism. We live in an age of highbrow superheroes, avant-garde video games, literary podcasts, and quality television. The question Warshaw's seemingly dated analysis compels us to ask is simple. How have these new entrants changed the household of art? That's the question. And though I will only obliquely allude to Dan's work in what follows, my own ongoing pursuit of an answer can trace its origin back to the days of my undergraduate thesis and to Dan's mentorship. As I hope will become apparent, what I'm offering here isn't only a biographical and personal connection. Instead, I think Dan's career, his humanistic formalism, and methodological pluralism offers one promising approach for pursuing literary and cultural studies today. 50 years after Dan started his career at Cornell, I will suggest, his approach to, to literary study has come to seem prescient. Dan has, in many cases, anticipated our post-postmodern moment, our age of surface reading, post-critique, new formalism, in a widespread renewal of interest in normative and evaluative criticism. And this, I think, reflects back on what uh, Jim Phelan said yesterday. I think the connections that he was drawing between Dan's writing and some of these newer movements, who are in many cases not citing Dan or not in dialogue with him, is right on the mark. I think there, there's a lot of connection there that we can maybe talk about in the Q&A. These new methods are not all the same or even internally unified uh, movements, but they all confront a version of the same problem. How do we understand the relationship between art and history, between aesthetics and sociology, between what a text means and what a text does, between what our common cultural life is and what it ought to be? I will begin my inquiry into these questions by discussing Alison Bechdel's graphic memoir, Fun Home, a family tragic comic. Published in 2006 by Houghton Mifflin, Bechdel's memoir tells the story of her troubled relationship with her father, Bruce. And here I'll distinguish between Bechtel, the narrator, uh, an author, and Allison, the character who is in the text Fun Home. Though it is a memoir, as Dan says, uh, she is a kind of fictionalized or imagined or narrativized version of Bechtel, the person. Um, the graphic memoir braids together the story of Allison's effort to come to terms with her sexuality and the story of her father's lifelong struggle to conceal his own homosexuality. The book is framed as a sort of mystery. A few months after Allison comes out as a lesbian to her family, Bruce is killed by a truck. Allison is convinced that he has committed suicide, and the memoir is thus built around her effort to understand why he might have ultimately chosen to kill himself. Fun Home is one of the most uh, widely celebrated graphic narratives in the history of the medium. It was widely and generously reviewed. It was a huge bestseller. Time Magazine named Fun Home its Book of the Year, choosing it over Cormac McCarthy's The Road and Lawrence Wright's The Looming Tower. So to give you a sense, it's not that it won best book in its own category. It sort of was deemed better in whatever sense you want to use, you know, over The Road and over The Looming Tower. 
In 2013, Fun Home was adapted into a Broadway musical, which itself won Tony Awards for Best Musical, Best Book of a Musical, and Best Original Score. And Bechtel was given a MacArthur Foundation grant in 2014, and she was uh, one of the first cartoonists to win this honor, but uh, recently there have been others, which maybe I'll talk about at the end. So I want to do a little bit of a close reading of uh, one of the climactic moments of the book. Uh, at this moment in the graphic memoir, the climax of the final chapter, Allison and her father are taking a drive together to watch a movie. For the first time since she has announced to her family that she is a lesbian, Allison tries to have a frank conversation with her father about her sexuality and his own. She has recently learned that her father has been having affairs with men for decades, and the encounter is tense. Allison's effort to connect with her father is not going well in the sequence. Bechtel represents this tension formally by changing the panel layout typical of the rest of Fun Home. Featuring 12 square panels per page, this two-page spread creates an array of equally apportioned spatial beats. By constructing an invariant background of panels, each showing a nearly identical drawing of Allison and Bruce, Bechdel focuses our attention not on the panel layout, but on other representational variables. Much of the emotional drama of the sequence plays out on the faces of the characters. The alternation of captioned commentary and stilted dialogue, as well as subtle changes in Allison's and Bruce's expressions, dramatize the awkward failure of daughter and father to connect. The lost opportunity is heavy with our retrospective knowledge as readers that this is Allison's last failed chance to have an honest conversation with her father. He will shortly after this scene be killed by a truck, a truck that I mentioned before. The final six panels of the sequence are especially notable, not only because there is no dialogue, but also because the accompanying caption invokes the equivocal encounter between Leopold Bloom and Stephen Daedalus in the Ithaca chapter of James Joyce's Ulysses. Bechtel writes, it was not the sobbing joyous reunion of Odysseus and Telemachus. It was more like fatherless Stephen and sonless Bloom having their equivocal late night cocoa at 7 Eccle Street. But which of us was the father? After Bechtel's narrator asks his question, Allison and Bruce watch the movie that they were going to see, and as they leave the theater, Bechtel comments that, I would see my father one more time after this, but we would never discuss our shared predilection again, and in a caption superimposed over a hand-drawn reproduction of Allison's copy of Ulysses, Bechtel writes, we had had our Ithaca moment. The remainder of the final chapter extends Bechtel's comparison between the Allison-Bruce relationship and the Stephen Bloom relationship in Ulysses. In a dazzling series of reversals, Allison becomes both Stephen and Bloom, and Bechtel finds herself becoming the father of her father. Bruce is himself a supreme artificer, a, ma a master of false seductive appearances, whose life of artifice becomes the very subject matter of Allison's art. Bechtel's act of graphic memoir therefore becomes not only a means of remembering her father, but also a form through which she's able retrospectively to invent him. In the final pages of Fun Home, reflecting on the Joycean theme that spiritual, not consubstantial paternity is the important thing, Bechtel's narrator wonders in a sequence of moving captions whether it is so unusual for spiritual and consubstantial paternity to coincide. Bechtel's Joycean ruminations are not just imposed from outside the narrative, but are also motivated within the story. At the same time that she has been exploring her sexual identity, Allison reluctantly takes a winter session course at Oberlin on Ulysses. Ulysses is, we learn, her father's favorite book of all time. And the opening chapter of Fun Home has already set up an aesthetic opposition between Allison and Bruce. He is Victorian, she is modern, and yet throughout the memoir, Allison has strenuously resisted replicating her father's modernist literary tastes. She sometimes suggests that her father's love of modernism has inspired him to model himself on the pathological lives of his literary heroes. But at this crucial final moment of Fun Home, modernism transitions from being the subject matter of Bechtel's recollections to being a formal model for the memoir itself. 
On the one hand, Bechtel's choice of literary model stages Alison's failure to connect with her father, Bruce. On the other hand, by making her memoir a formal descendant of Ulysses, by submitting, her by submitting to her father's aesthetic priorities, Bechtel creates a father-daughter reconciliation through art that life itself did not afford her. In a curious figurative fulfillment of Bruce's life, Bruce's favorite book of all time becomes Allison's and Bechtel's book. Allison becomes an artist, and not just any kind of artist, but a sort of modernist artist. So what does it mean, uh, what is the meaning of Bechtel's invocation of modernism? Does it make sense to call a cartoonist drawing her memoir during the first decade of the 21st century a modernist artist? Recent modernist studies scholarship might welcome such a claim. If we regard modernism not as a period, but as a as my colleague at the University of Maryland, Brian Richardson, has argued, we might as well call any work of art that features certain characteristic formal features modernist. Indeed, Richardson suggests that high modernism should not be limited to the works of a handful of writers working between 1914 and 1939. Instead, it stretches from the last phase of Henry James to the latest novels of Graham Swift, Kazuo Ishiguro, and Nadine Gordimer. Richardson's claim for modernism surprisingly resonates with the project of the new modernist studies. The critical movement inaugurated in a manifesto published by Rebecca Wolkowitz and Doug Mao a decade ago in the pages of PMLA. After all, the project of the new modernist studies was and is to expand the geographic, generic, and temporal scope of modernist scholarship though most scholars of modernism still understand their period as extending roughly from the late 19th uh, century through the middle of the 20th centuries, why not expand modernism's temporal scale to the present or emphasize points of continuity rather than rupture between uh, 1922 and 2006? Yet I do not think we should accept this view, and I don't accept it partly because I subscribe to Dan's credo, always the text, always historicize. History matters, and the return or reappraisal of characteristically modernist forms in the 21st century doesn't simply replicate modernism or simply constitute another example of it, but also transforms its meaning. As David, as David James and Ramila Shishijiri argue in a more recent PMLA piece, we risk dulling modernism's particular brilliance when we dissolve it into a collective of techniques comparable with what other writers have practiced at other points in history. And yet, James and Seshajiri cannot help but notice the surprisingly persistent legacy of modernism in contemporary literature. They catalog the creative work of writers who place a conception of European modernism as revolution at the heart of their fictions. These are writers whose um, who style their 21st century literary innovations as explicit engagements with the innovations of early 20th century writings. Contemporary literature, they suggest, consciously responds to modernist impulses, methods, and commitments. Writers such as Tom McCarthy, Zadie Smith, Ian McEwan, and Jam Kutze have adopted uh, an inventive, self-conscious relationship with modernist literature. There is a perspicuous irony in this development at the very moment when literary critics would give us a radically expanded account of modernism, creative, writer, creative writers double down on a surprisingly traditional modernist canon. James and Seshajiri call these writers metamodernists, uh, and I find their account of metamodernism persuasive, but their argument uh, fails to describe the historical circumstances in which these recent writers have been reviving modernism. Such modernist revivals aren't just a way to enter an intertextual dialogue with high modernist writers. After all, canonical postmodernists such as Thomas Pynchon, Ishmael Reed, and Kathy Acker did exactly the same thing. They also entered into intertextual, albeit critical, relationships with modernist precursors. That's why it's called postmodernism, right? Like, there's a reason for that choice of term. Um, what justifies a new name for what more recent writers are doing is that these authors are engaged in a specifically, and forgive the term, post-postmodern gesture. The return to modernism for them represents a rejection of postmodernist aesthetic values and post-structuralist theoretical commitments. 
So metamodernism should be regarded as part of a broader cultural trend or tendency away, or beyond, away from or beyond the postmodern. It might be regarded as one among a range of, uh, the word uh, metamodernism might be regarded as one of uh, many competing names for that cultural moment, our cultural present. Critics have lately suggested other names for this development, including cosmodernism, digimodernism, remodernism, post-postmodernism, and so on. And I have to admit that even as I find the individual critics who develop these terms insightful, their uh, collective proliferation of new critical terms and new critical jargon can sometimes border on the ridiculous. And of course, I pass this harsh judgment even as I admit to having participated in the academic mania for coining neologisms. It's just something you can't help but do. And I don't know why, you know, this is probably, you know, we just all need to be an analysis and we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but let us remember what is at stake in our investigation. Uh, it isn't a, which word we'll use to describe the arts and culture of the present. We began from the observation that modernism has taken on a surprisingly new cultural prestige and that cartoonists have turned with enthusiasm to various modernist intertexts. There are more recent examples that we can count. And so what I want to do is sort of give you a few examples and then uh, kind of bring it all together at the end. Uh, this, for instance, is the famous opening page of a three-page comic by Robert Crumb, which I used on my title slide. It's called Abstract Expressionist Super Ultra Modernistic Comics and its verbal and visual rhetoric obviously represent an ironic engagement with modernist precursors. This is more or less what we might expect from a work published for the first time in 1967, a year before Dan came to Cornell, at the height of the underground comics movement and the height of the counterculture. For participants in the movement, attacking the censorship of the mainstream comics industry could seem a piece with attacking highbrow authorities that relegated comics to the margins of American culture. So um, uh, Crumb is, in some sense, rejecting uh, uh, relationship with modernism. He's citing modernist styles in order to sort of hold them at arm's length. Leaping ahead to the 70s and the 80s, we might also cite Art Spiegelman's early formalist works collected in breakdowns, or Spiegelman and Francois, his wife Francois Mouly's anthology, Raw, both frequently allude to various modernist graphical styles and explore the medium-specific potential of comics. Here, modernist styles and modernist ideologies of autonomy, uh, the autonomy of the work of art, serve as a means by which Spiegelman could hem in the unrestrained id of the underground movement, represented by artists such as Crumb, joining a larger critical reevaluation of counterculture and postmodernism. So Crumb cites modernism to make fun of it, say, I, I don't do that crap, and Spiegelman is uncomfortable you know, with the underground comic scene where he's coming out of. And he is turning to modernism in a different key, in a different way, uh, which I, I think of as uh, more serious, less ironic, and, and I can go into that in more detail in later. later. Um, the intense formalism of Spiegelman's early sensibility has gone on to inform the careers of numerous cartoonists. Perhaps the most prominent is Chris Ware, who, though he doesn't directly allude to modernist graphical styles, has employed his experimental cartooning styles to investigate the logic of modernity and the effects of modernity on everyday life. This is a two-page spread from his masterful 2012 uh, work, Building Stories, which collects 14 books that are kind of formatted variously. Some of them are you know, fold out like a newspaper. Some of them are formatted as if they were a little golden book. Some of them are like flip books. Uh, and collects them all in a single box that is the size of a uh, board game box. And uh, you can sort of see what the challenges of, of this are. This is a two-page spread. You know, how do you read this? Do you read it from top to bottom? Do you read it across? What is this child doing in the middle of the spread? Uh, and I've taught this um, in graduate courses, and I've taught his other works in undergraduate courses, and I promised to say something about teaching. So what I'll say is that when I teach where, uh, and when I teach comics, a lot of students come in thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to take this course on comics and the graphic novel. This is going to be a really easy class. This is going to be, this is going to be fun. You know, we're going to read fun stuff. And, and the first thing I have to tell them is you will not have fun in this class. This is going to be hard. This is not going to be, uh, you know, a course where you can just skim the reading. You're going to have to do more work in some sense if you're not familiar with this graphical idiom. So that's Chris Ware. He's a fantastic artist in his own right. 
Uh, G.B. Tran's recent graphic uh, memoir, Vietnamerica, meanwhile, explicitly uses French Impressionism as a visual intertext in order to tell the story of his family's experience in Vietnam in uh, the years leading up to and during the Vietnam War. Tran, Tran uses Tran uses Impressionist styles to allude to the movement's influence on his father, who was a talented painter in Vietnam. Indeed, he contrasts his father's own talents as a painter to his own inclination toward cartooning, and he juxtaposes an Impressionist visual style, which you can see here, with the Ling Claire style of cartooning, most famously associated with the Belgian cartoonist Hergé. So this is a little smaller, but if you see in the upper right-hand corner, this is his homage to Hergé. And then over here on the left, you see his incorporation of his father's Impressionism into the narrative of Vietnamerica. Uh, at other moments in his text, Trans incorporates the bright primary colors of Vietnamese communist propaganda. So you can see that over here. Um, these diverse graphical allusions, which frequently collide with each other on his fascinating pages, serve in this memoir as a means by which Tran uh, can explore what we might call, uh, adopting a phrase from Ro Rosalind Krauss, the optical unconscious of Vietnam's colonial and post-colonial condition. So uh, the kind of French colonial context reemerges in the form of the Hergé, Franco-Belgian, uh, Lynn Claire style. And, and this is sort of quite sophisticated in, in the way that he weaves this through his narrative. Um, I won't talk about this at length, but we might also cite uh, the collection Abstract Comics, edited by Andre Molitou, which visually cites a range of graphical modernist styles, expressionist styles, and other experimental modes drawn from across the 20th century. And we might finally briefly mention comics that are less formally experimental, but which nonetheless engage with specific modernist precursors. These are examples on the right of a comic by Annie Mock, who rendered graphically the story of Joyce's Araby, and on the left, an ongoing project by Robert Berry and Josh Levitas to create a visual reader's guide to Ulysses. The project is called Ulysses Scene and has so far drawn visual companions to the Telemachus, Nestor, Lotus Eaters, and Calypso chapters of the book and is available as an iPad app, of all things. Okay. We've seen enough examples to return to the claim uh, made by James and Seshajiri. It would be tempting to agree with them to say that the interest on the part of recent cartoonists in modernist texts and styles represents a sort of metamodernism in the field of comics. And yet, to return to the example with which I began my inquiry, Fun Home isn't a novel reflecting back on modernism, but rather a graphic memoir. It isn't a novel reflecting back on, on modernism, but rather a graphic memoir. Um, let me repeat my question about Fun Home in a sharper key then. What does it mean to revive modernism by means of an art form that for much of the 20th century was the very emblem of what modernism excluded? One answer in light of these examples is that modernism has become synonymous for us with cultural value as such. Any new or upwardly mobile art form that seeks recognition will likely do so in modernist terms. This is not just true in the field of comics. The author of a recent book published by the MIT Press called Avant-Garde Video Games, for example, uses Impressionism and Cubism as milestones of value to assess the contribution of a number of recent games. Writing of Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore's 1986 graphic novel Watchmen, another critic has described the mid-1980s as the comic book's modernist era. Watchmen, after all, alongside Art Spiegelman's graphic memoir about his father's experience of the Holocaust, and uh, Frank Miller's reimagining of the Batman story in The Dark Knight Returns are often held up together as major innovations in the field of comics, inaugural moments in the history of the form, the moment when comics in some sense grew up. In writing of the Ubapo group, uh, the comics scholar Bart Beatty has claimed that comics had no modernist moment. The art form uh, wore a dunce cap for most of the 20th century, and I should say Ubapo is a group explicitly modeled on the Ulipo group, uh, so they're interested in sort of thinking up uh, different combinatory possibilities for the form. And I'll, you know, in the interest of time, I'll not go into a close reading of this. Uh, the acronym translates from uh, something like Workshop of Potential Comic Book Art, and it perhaps represents the leading edge of experimentation in the international comics field. Spiegelman's early uh, formalism taken, taken to the next level, 
uh, the Ubapo group in the view of Beatty asked us to imagine a modernist art movement in a postmodern era, ironically championing the value of comics so that the notion of comics as valuable no longer seems ironic. This belated modernism is, even for Beatty, qualified. Though we are postmodern, we don't believe in antiquated discourses of value. We nonetheless are able to imagine comics as modern or modernist so as to confer some simulacrum of value upon the form. We are back at the conceptual impasse undergirding Warshaw's analysis of film, the impasse with which I began my talk. Are we justified in taking off the scare quotes from Beatty's critical assessment? What happens when we stop ironically championing the notion that comics can be art and simply affirm that it is? What will we now be able to recognize about the transformed household of art in the 21st century? So we, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I'm gonna try to wrap it up. Um, I cannot develop a full account of my answer today, but I will conclude by offering hints about what an answer might look like. Our answer will have to revise claims made by a prior generation of postmodernist scholars about cultural value. Uh, 30 years ago, when critics debated the meaning of postmodernism, one influential faction claimed that postmodernism de demolished the high-low boundary, undermined arts autonomy, uh, and, and challenged uh, prior narratives of um, high art. The Marxist literary critic Fred Frederick Jameson wrote in his classic essay, Postmodernism and Consumer Culture, uh, that postmodern art no longer quoted mass culture, paraliterature, and kitsch, but rather incorporated them to the point where the line between high art and commercial forms seems increasingly difficult to draw. Cultural production has been, on this view, largely, perhaps wholly, absorbed into capitalism, and the critical distance required for oppositional consciousness has been nearly foreclosed in the age of the culture industry and the great multinational corporations. Now, um, I won't go in sort of into like depth about you know, the, the details, kind of the technical details of Jameson's argument, but I think like Jameson's argument had some local validity. It was, appropriate, it was an appropriate way of characterizing certain parts of American cultural life, maybe from like uh, the 1960s to the 1980s. But I don't think it really holds the same kind of validity today. Uh, we are not postmodern or not quite postmodern in the same way anymore. And to be sure, our current president is a former reality television star, a cartoon character in the pejorative sense of the term cartoon. I would like to think that uh, uh, I, I would like to think of him, to borrow Raymond Williams' critical terms, as more of a residual cultural phenomenon, a figure whose ultimate failure might harbor a more serious political future, but that might just be wishful thinking on my part. Uh, in any case, many critics and artists today would resist the idea that there is uh, no longer a serious distin distinction between high art and popular culture. Okay. Many still, and with increasing passion, defend art, art's autonomy against postmodern claims to the contrary. But even if we are still skeptical about the category of autonomy, and I think we should be, we cannot eliminate uh, with it the category of art. We need to account for a world in which the category of art hasn't vanished, but has become more prominent and widespread than ever. Critics need to revise uh, their cultural maps of the present. Uh, new arts are today mass produced more efficiently than ever before. So many low forms, so many genres, so many distinct mediums, so many formerly non-artistic activities have risen and are on the rise that former categories we have used to describe positions within our cultural field need to be seriously reconsidered. You know, under such circumstances, I think it's right to say that we live in something like an age of mass high culture. What we need to do is not only interpret the specific products of this age, but also give an account for a world in which it has become possible for cartoonists to win MacArthur Foundation fellowships, to win Pulitzers, and to be recognized justly, in my view, as numbering among the most dynamic and vital artists working today. As we look ahead to the next 50 years of literary and cultural study, I hope we can recognize that a whole new field of questions has opened up. And though we often speak of a crisis in the humanities, I tend to think of that crisis uh, as more of a crisis affecting the institutions that support humanistic research than a crisis in our critical and intellectual methods. Uh, there is still a lot of work to do. That work is more vital than ever, and students are genuinely excited to participate in that work. And I will say, kind of by way of conclusion, that a version of Dan's humanistic formalism and methodological pluralism looks pretty good as a way of formulating answers to this question, to these questions and in, in sort of initiating this investigation and launching these new studies that we need. In Dan's vision of modernism, there is no trace of the Mandarin, no discernible elitism, no strained effort to secure autonomy from a wider culture, 
Dan's insistence that we make and seek out art to better understand life, that reading texts is a way of reading lives, is a flexible yet specific cultural credo and critical credo that uh, has aged a lot better than many of the credos espoused by competing ideologies. So let me, for real, end by quoting Dan's own words uh, from his wonderful manifesto, uh, In Defensive Reading, published in 2008 by Wiley Blackwell. Literature is by humans, for humans, and about humans. Humanistic critics believe in the importance of both the author's conception of their subject and the choices they make in terms of technique, structure, and style because ultimately meaning depends on those choices. I believe that the close reading of texts, both from an authorial and resistant perspective, enables us to perceive more clearly. I believe in a continuity between reading texts and reading lives. I believe that the activity of critical thinking, not merely literary criticism, can be taught by the analysis of language. I believe in the place of the aesthetic. I believe that we can enter into imagined worlds and learn from them. Following Aristotle, I believe that the aesthetic, ethical, and political are inextricably linked. So as we look back uh, on 50 years of teaching and writing by Dan, and as we look ahead to the next 50 years of literary and cultural study, this strikes me as pretty good advice. Uh, I hope we can approach our work, our scholarship, our teaching, our advocacy for the discipline to a wider public with the same intellectual rigor critical generosity, and aesthetic openness that marked Dan's career. Thank you very much. You would think the answer would be yes, right? You would think that students uh, would have like loads of experience with visual texts and they would come into the classroom ready to en encounter visual texts. But I would almost argue the opposite, uh, that uh, many uh, students come into the classroom with preconceptions about how to read visually. And so, uh, you know, if, I, if, if in my uh, literature classes I can rely on some background that they've had in high school that has taught them how, uh, how to read closely, I can't do the same for a lot of the, say, the graphic novels that I teach. And so, like, the first step in those classes for me is to sort of force them to unlearn certain habits of reading and to really see what they're reading visually for the first time. And that it's actually can be quite difficult to do that. So for instance, you know, when I teach mouse, uh, many students have read mouse, right? Like lots of students have read mouse, but they've read it as a way of learning about the Holocaust and have in almost no cases encountered any kind of conversation about the form of mouse. And so you kind of, you start putting these images up, you know, it's the only reason I use PowerPoint because I teach comics. It's like you, you put these images up and you think, oh, look, look what Spiegelman is doing. The sort of smoke from a cigarette is coming out of this smokestack. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't notice. You know, it's like they, 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 don't, they don't see formally. And so I see my job as like teaching them to see in that way. And yeah, absolutely, right? So the continuity between my work on David Foster Wallace and my work on comics has to do with my sense that they're uh, similar, similarly interested in moving beyond uh, a certain kind of ironic or, or, or postmodern artistic set of styles. And uh, Spiegelman himself coined the phrase like neo-sincerity to describe his own project, actually. So it's, there's a direct connection to Spiegelman. Um, and I think, yeah, I, 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 would, I, would agree, I would agree. Like, I mean, I, I, like there are scholars who use the phrase new sincerity. Uh, I use like different uh, made up words to, to describe the same kind of phenomenon. Uh, but the, the point is the same, that there's this generation of writers raised in kind of the shadow of postmodern aesthetics who don't want to just abandon that inheritance, but also want to think like, what do, you, what do we do now? How do we move forward? So I, I would say yes to your, your question. First of all, uh, Lee taught me how to uh, read mouse graphically, which is something I appreciated. Uh, he really taught me how to, in the, the, the fancy term is like presses, and he taught, taught me that it wasn't just the literary, but it's much more the visual. But I would say a little bit, the question of modernism and postmodernism is interesting because on the one hand, I've discovered that some of the same things we used originally to describe postmoderns yeah. by skeptics. Yeah. Fragmentation, discontinuity, the lack of a grammar of motives and character, 
basically attacks on realism, um, and the compression, all of that were used to describe postmodernism. Yeah. And so sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, you know, that's why what you're saying has a good deal of uh, importance. On the other hand, my story for postmodernism is one by T.C. Boyle. He had a story in the New Yorker some years ago. And in the story, I'll do it very briefly, this guy who's kind of whacked out, it's a focalization on the boyfriend of a woman who's a marathoner. And the marathoner is, as it always loses to her rival. And so he, got this guy, decides he's going to intervene. And what he does, so they have a race, and he's there, and he's put together a, a, a potion of, of poison. And you know in a marathon how he water to the people as they run by. Well, the surprising thing happens that his girlfriend is in the lead. And of course, he's planning, you know what's going to happen, right? He knows planning on giving the poison right to the person in the lead. He notices that his girlfriend is in the lead and hands her the poison anyway. <laughs> Chilling, of course. And that's how the story ends. With his giving, it turns out that the plan for poison, the person in uh, first place was supposed to be, right? And the end of. So for me, that sort of sets up something that is postmodernism, postmodern, the grammar of motives mm -hmm. in the story. It's very difficult to get at until you reread it and you see that really he's a kind of failure and the girlfriend is successful and there's a great deal of anger going on and that he's kind of the third person in the race <laughs> and uh, in that. So so he killed them. But this is the kind of thing where you'll get postmodernism seems to depend on kind of rich, and it has even more discontinuity. But still, when you sort of come back to it the way I just did, just like I did yesterday with the story uh, about the Indian by the Bangalore writer, you can sort of recuperate it into modernism with a kind of grammar of motives, to use the term from Burke. The other thing which I would kind of pose to you since we're running out of time, is I find sometimes it's easier to talk about postmodernism in art. For yeah. example, if you think about how uh, maybe modernism is the move away from my, my thesis, abstract expressionism, you then come back to objects of somebody like Jasper John, who is really rebelling against that, and his postmodernism can best be summarized by take an object, do mm -hmm. something to it, do something right. else to it, yeah. repeat. And that is a kind of sort of way of domesticating objects as art mm -hmm. and taking us away from kind of the theoretical idea of art for art's sake and idealizing art. Yeah. And I'm going to leave you to make the last comment. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, obviously, we could. Yeah, that, that we could go on for another hour talking about these issues, but I think, yeah, so the, you know, like for me, I'm, I both use these terms and I'm allergic to them at the same time. Like what I care about are the kind of cultural objects. I care about thinking about what is Fun Home doing, you know, what, what, are, what is Vietnam America doing, what is, what is uh, where doing, and, and so when these terms come up, they're often coming up, as in the case with the David Foster Wallace essay, as objects of uh, uh, artistic interest in themselves. That is to say, like, these are people who go to school, they read essays on postmodernism, they react against it in a, kind of a particular historical moment. And so for me, you know, thinking about like Bechdel at Oberlin in the early 80s, taking a course on Ulysses, and what does Ulysses mean in that moment, and how is she reusing it? Like, that's the thing that sort of uh, kind of uh, drives my inquiry. Uh, now, as, as for um, visual art, I would say, yeah, I mean, like, uh, like a lot of the theorizations of postmodernism 
were written in response to and with reference to specific visual art objects. Like, you know, a lot of writing is on Andy Warhol, right? Like Warhol's Brillo boxes are the kind of spur to uh, like Arturo Danto's kind of claims about the end of art, uh, to Jameson's analysis of what the flatness of postmodern culture is all about. And so I think there's a tendency for a lot of critics, especially critics sort of in the 80s, that they're grasping for a way to talk about the entirety of their cultural moment. And so the tendency to take that one object and then reify it and make it the kind of the story of the moment, like that's where I, I feel like we have to be careful as well. And so I, to go back to your first point, I agree totally that like in some of these great theorizations of modernism and postmodernism, you know, exactly the same things get said about both sets of art objects and they get valorized or demonized in the same way uh, for this, exactly the same aesthetic features that the prior generation were using. And so, yeah, I totally agree with that. And we could have a much longer conversation. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.